I'm Cameron Carpenter, the organist. I'm working extremely hard to move the organ, both in terms of its design and what we do with it, in a much more contemporary direction, obviously a much more secular direction. One has such a huge selection here uh, at Amoeba Music that the only thing that I couldn't find was Arthur Rubinstein's phenomenal score to War Games, the Matthew Broderick 80s movie. And what might seem a frivolous movie um, in the case of War Games, of course, is, is probably the best or at least the best produced of the great 80s nuclear war fear hysteria movie. And a staggering array of talents from somebody who could write music, you know, that's at the sophistication of Richard Strauss to also being able to write in the same film score um, a completely dated kind of 80s pop electronica. To have those talents in, in one person is just amazing, and that and many more. So unfortunately I didn't find that, but Arthur Rubinstein's score to War Games is a must. Um, here's Deal or No Deal with Khalifa. That party get high and tell them lames to the plane or let fly. Don't know what they hate for, I'm just getting my paper. Well, maybe they'll love me more when I'm gone. I don't want to leave. Wiz Khalifa, I think, is such an incredibly poetic um, artist and musician. I don't have the biases that classical musicians often have the reputation of having. I think they don't have it as much as people think they do. Um, another example would be this album, Chitty Bang Breakfast. For one thing, I'm completely in love with the cover, partly because I'm really addicted to colorful graphic design and, you know, the culture of disposability, and, like candy wrappers, cereal boxes. Mind your manners, you hear me? And all the people should be raising their glasses, flow crazy, celebrating the madness. Hip hop is important and incumbent upon any serious musician who's out in the world to know about such things. Um, the same would very much apply to my next two selections. First of all, the soundtrack to Frozen. There's a huge amount of discussion in the classical music. What classical music is anymore is, is, is itself a huge source of debate. For those of us who also want to try to figure out how you fit in economically, commercially, to a larger fabric of things that are happening in the world musically, and particularly how you do that 5, 10, 20 years down the line, which is a huge, huge issue for me, since I play an instrument which is at the very fringes even of classical music and, and barely relevant to any aspect of society at all, the organ. You have to look at what people are listening to and what people who will be musical consumers of whatever kind in 5 or 10 or 20 years what will have been brought to bear on those years. And when I think back to when I was five, ten years old, then I think back to the television music, you know, the movies that my dad used to take me to see, uh, The Rescuers Down Under, there's still a, an incredible scene where the little boy is saving this eagle. You're free. Ah! There's this huge orchestral moment that happens. But it's, you know, it's orchestral music that's for kids and for adults and families and stuff. I'm a person who's able to say with two Juilliard degrees that that kind of music is really important to the musician I am today. To a great many people, and a great many people who would make any artistic administrator of any self-respecting orchestra in the, anywhere in the world drool with envy at the box office, this is the most important music, some of it. So you have to know it. Uh, same goes for this. You need to know what's going on, because um, it's going to be important historically. It's going to be it's something that your own audiences will know whether you like it or not. And, um, and so for that reason, I want, to be able, I want to be sure that the presence of Taylor Swift in this album, which you will see everywhere in the world, is not just something that I know about because I heard about other people talking about it and I'm going back on the plane to play with some orchestra. I want to know it because I listened to the songs. That's what a musician should do. 
switching gears to some degree, but again, stretching the, the, you know, playing on the cultural relevance issue, you'd have to know the music of Bernard Herrmann. You want to talk about uh, film music, then you have to talk about this guy, classic documents in American filmmaking and in American um, film scoring, Jason and the Argonauts, something that's not terribly well known now, uh, except among film buffs, but at its day was when that film came out, particularly the scene of Jason fighting the skeletons was, you know, one of the ultimate achievements in film technology at the time and still quite, quite frightening to me. Far the better and the more effective for having the music of this great, great composer with it. Uh, as a kid growing up in northwestern Pennsylvania, homeschooled with, with limited access to what we'd call cultural or aesthetic uh, documents of any kind, uh, the singing of Michael Feinstein was one of the first, probably the first time that I uh, understood what a love song was. He loves and she loves and they love so why can't you love and I love too? It's the first time that I got the idea that a person would really be able to use music as a vehicle for their own sort of expressive performance. This is when I was, you know, three, four, five years old. And it was actually this album, uh, Michael Feinstein, Pure Gershwin. Uh, so those are, those are my selections. and I. I hope I've defended them half decently. Thank you so much for talking with us My today. very great pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Amoeba!